All right, yeah, thanks for having me here. It's, uh, I'm looking forward to these uh, varied perspectives on deep learning. And uh, originally, I'd planned to only speak about generalization, which is just a new paper. But uh, then I realized I'm the first speaker today. So I also uh, took the liberty of adding like 15, 20 minutes of introduction. Um, and uh, so I'll start by uh, reminding you, and just to set up the notation uh, and uh, terminology, I'll remind you what's deep learning. And for simplicity, I've uh, drawn here a fully connected uh, deep net where the layers are fully connected, no convolutions, for example, or weight sharing. Um, and yeah, you have a layer of uh, computing units. Uh, you can think of them as gates, uh, which usually have nonlinearities. And the parameters uh, are the weights on the edges and the nodes, the biases on the nodes. Uh, and they define an input output function. And so if you are, and uh, in supervised learning, you are trying to classify data according to some labels. And so you're given some uh, data from a distribution, which are labeled. So x1, y1 is the data label pair. And uh, this is the training data. And for each data point x and each label y, there is a loss function, l theta x y, where the neural net given by the parameters theta, the parameter vector theta, how well does its output match the true label y on input x? So it can be formalized using L2, cross entropy, et cetera. And the objective then is uh, to minimize this training loss, this loss function, on the training data. So, uh, and it's, uh, you would imagine that you would, uh, I mean, it's a non convex and very nonlinear function usually, and you would imagine you'd use some very sophisticated uh, optimization algorithm, but actually all you use is gradient descent. So I'm assuming most people have seen this uh, before. And uh, stochastic gradient descent is the analog where uh, you, because it, it, computing even the full gradient is very expensive if you have a network with uh, millions of parameters and you have millions of training data. It's very difficult to compute that, that full gradient where you have to sum over all training data. And so you just take an estimate of, say, a few hundred data points. And uh, because of linearity of expectations, the, uh, the, the average of the gradient computer according to that small sample is still uh, an estimate for the full gradient. OK, so in that basic uh, setup, here are the mysteries, or some mysteries. There are many more. Um, why or how does optimization find decent solution? Because this uh, function is highly non-convex, and gradient descent is just following, as the name suggests, the gradient. So why does it end up in any kind of, op uh, let's say, if not a global optimum, but at least a globally good solution? Um, why do nets generalize? So by the way, we know that it's actually going pretty much to close to the global solution because uh, the training loss usually goes to zero. Okay, so that loss function, it basically goes to zero, which is about as well as you could do. So, uh, so we know that it's finding very good solutions. Um, why do these nets generalize? In other words, predict well on unseen data. So you train them on a million images, why do they do well on the images you'll see in future? So for example, uh, a running example in this talk will be VGG19, on which we did a lot of experiments. It's an architecture with 19 layers. And it has six, more than 6 million variables. And you can train it on CIFAR10, which has 50,000 examples. And it predicts fine on unseen examples. So this just uh, overturns, or seems to overturn, a lot of classical uh, insights from statistical theory that you should avoid having too many variables in your, in your model. By the way, gener so generalization error is the difference between the test error and the training error. Test error is the error on the full distribution, and training error is on the training data. So generalization error is the difference between the two. And as I said, training error usually goes to zero in, in more neural networks. In neural networks. And uh, another mystery is expressiveness, interpretability. What are the nodes expressing? Uh, you know, it's just one big black box. And how is this depth useful? Okay, because uh, in the past, people were just trying to do networks with a couple of layers. And these days, there are hundreds or even thousands of layers. 
Now, all of these questions are probably interrelated. Um, and uh, and the explanation will probably be overlapping. So talk overview, yeah, the first half is just survey in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes of efforts to understand the above mysteries. And the second half will be details on our recent work on the generalization mystery. So understanding non-convex optimization. Now, there are actually, if you uh, look in the literature, lots of papers recently, uh, obviously motivated by deep learning, but not about deep learning, where people analyze non-convex optimization for quite a few interesting machine learning problems, matrix completion, topic modeling, sparse coding, tensor decomposition, HMM learning, et cetera, et cetera, many other problems. So here you have a non-convex objective, and you can analyze it. So uh, how, do these, how do these work? So it turns out that all of these results need to make assumptions about how the data was generated. OK, so most of them are, uh, are algorithms that assume that the data was generated according to some probabilistic model. Uh, and so the optimization landscape is understood. I mean, the parameters are not known, but at least the overall structure of the landscape is understood. And in fact, we know what the optimum solution is. It's the ground truth model which generated the data. OK, and that's where you're going towards. And uh, so the main idea, so the analysis uses that. The main idea behind the analysis of these algorithms is uh, that you prove that the direction of movement, so you, you had some point theta. By the way, is there a pointer? Yeah, there is a pointer. So, uh, no, it's not working. Maybe the batteries are. Uh, it's fine. Uh, oh, it does work. I have to press harder. Is it? I don't see it. No, it is on. Oh, there. Oh, there. Okay, I see. It's very small. Okay, now I see it. Yeah, so theta is the current point you're at. And there, when you follow the gradient, you move in some direction. And uh, in the background is this optimum solution theta star, where you want to be. And the analysis shows, you know, because it understands mathematically what the optimum is and what the gradient is and so on, it proves that the direction of movement at this point theta is positively correlated with the desired direction, which is the displacement from theta to theta star. So theta, if, you, if you had full foresight, you would be trying to move exactly along that line Theta minus theta, theta star minus theta, but uh, you're moving along the gradient or some kind of local improvement. And the analysis shows that this local improvement positively correlates with the direction that you want to go to. So it's some kind of movement. It's moving in some general direction, but it's positively correlated. So it's making progress. It's getting closer. Uh, so by the way, this is not written in any paper. Uh, when Teng Yuma was a Student here, we sort of looked at some of these papers, mostly he did, and we figured out this framework. And it's written up in a blog post on our blog, offconvex.org. OK, so this is how we know how to analyze non-convex optimization. Right? And you can see that in this strategy can only work when you understand something about the landscape. Now, the problem is that in deep learning, the optimization landscape is unknown. Now you might be saying, oh, wait a second, unknown? You just wrote the cost function for me. I mean, that's the landscape, right? So this was a cost function. So in what, in what sense is this unknown? Well, it's unknown because we don't have any mathematical description of what are the inputs XIs, you know, what are real images, what are fMRI data, whatever, you know, whatever your data is. We don't have any mathematical description of that. And we don't have any description of the labels, OK? What, is a, what makes an image an image of a cat or a dog? So we lack that mathematical theory. And so, so that's why you know, one analogy could be you, know, you have a, some function with random coefficients or unknown coefficients. Okay? And so then really you don't have any idea of the, of the landscape. Okay? That's the problem in deep learning. So it's, yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Result. Oh, so you have to quantify that. You have to quantify that, sorry. So I, I mean, when you look at the blog post, you know, there's some alpha and beta, you know, some coefficient. So it has to move substantially, not just be correlated, move sub substantially correlated. And that guarantees what, global convergence? Yeah. Okay. 
I mean, that, that follows, right? I mean, there's a fixed distance. You're always making some progress if you're positive. Yeah. OK, so uh, all right. So given that we lack this mathematical description of the objective function, what we are stuck with is analyzing non-convex optimization in an unknown landscape. And then, of course, all bets are off. You know, this problem is NP-hard and whatever. You know, so this, you cannot hope to have uh, any kind of provable guarantee. We should be clear about this. So, uh, so then what are people doing? So what people are doing is analyzing gradient descent in this unknown landscape. And there are these classical optimization ideas going back decades, which people are applying to show that actually you are, uh, arrive, say, at a local optimum. And then there are conjectures, and there are probably people in the room, or will be, who, who are suggesting that actually local optima are good enough. OK, so, uh, so how do these uh, classical optimization ideas work? Well, suppose the gradient is not 0. Well, then there's a descent direction, right? Suppose it's substantially non-zero. Then there's a descent direction, right? You just uh, go a little bit along the gradient, and you are guaranteed to reduce the cost function a little bit. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that it's a nonlinear function. And, and you know, the second derivative, we don't know how it behaves. And it could be that you move a little bit, and the gradient shifts a lot. And so what you thought was a descent direction ends up not being a descent direction. So all it guarantees is that you can move infinitesimally, and then you, uh, you, you reduce the cost function. And that's not enough for quick convergence. It was related to your question earlier. So, so therefore, to ensure descent, you have to take small enough steps. And that the, the amount of uh, movement you can do, the, the step size, is determined by the smoothness. Depends on the second derivative. And once you trade those off, you can conclude that you're guaranteed to close, get close to some point within gra with gradient roughly 0 in some fixed amount of time, depending upon those, the norms of those derivatives, et cetera. OK, so that's the way people have been trying to analyze this. Is this enough? OK, so you get to a point where the gradient is approximately 0. Is that enough? No, because there could be saddle points. So for example, uh, as the name suggests, it's, uh, it's a point where you could be a minimum in, many in n minus 1 dimensions and a maximum in the other. So there is a descent direction still to, to descend further. But how do you find that one dimension, one unknown direction in, a C, in, you know, in high dimensions? OK, so it's like a needle in a haystack kind of problem. So, uh, so this has been analyzed, uh, a nice paper of Ge Huang, Jin, and Yang. Ge was a grad student here, is uh, to add noise to gradient descent. So that's called perturbed gradient descent. And uh, now if you add noise to the gradient descent, you know, even if it gets close to a saddle point, it sort of walks around. Its, it's movement is kind of like a random walk, right? Because you've added noise to the gradient descent, so it's moving in a slightly random direction. So it's kind of like a random walk, and they can analyze a random walk and show that within polynomial in D over epsilon, sorry, D is the same as dimension, uh, two, two terms for it. So D is dimension. So within polynomial in D over epsilon time, you can escape all saddle points and get to an approximate uh, second order local minimum. Uh, and it's an analysis of a random walk like that. Uh, you know, it, uh, I've drawn some pictures there. And uh, this analysis has been improved. So it's now basically a near optimal result. Just as an aside, uh, physics people are very interested in something called Langevin dynamics. Uh, and that's also perturbed gradient descent with a large noise. And uh, maybe there will be some talks about that later. Um, by the way, so you're wondering, so, so now what's the recipe? So I, I said that you train neural nets with gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. And now I'm talking about perturbed gradient descent. So where did that come from? Is that the recommended algorithm for optimization? No. The, the hypothesis is that stochastic gradient descent already has enough noise that it sort of acts like perturbed gradient descent. So that's the suggestion. Uh, also by the Langevin folks. You know, the Langevin folks are also saying that you know, if you just do stochastic gradient descent, it all inherently has enough noise in it that it acts kind of like Langevin dynamics. OK, so uh, another wor uh, piece of work which I won't talk about is this work from physics. And again, maybe there'll be people later who will talk more about it. Uh, there are these models based on spin glasses. Um, uh, statistical physics, uh, physicists always like models based on that. 
And based on that, there are these simplistic accounts of deep learning landscape. And the suggestion is that the landscape has many local minima, which are almost as good as the global minimum. Um, and in general, yeah, this whole field, as was alluded to in the opening remarks, is a little bit like the elephant, and we are the blind man, and we all have our own existing tools, and we are uh, approaching this with that. OK, part two, briefly about expressiveness and depth before I move on to generalization. OK, so role of depth. Uh, well, so one ideal result would be to show that depth helps. OK, because in principle, you can do all of deep learning with depth too. But we know that uh, the constructions there would rely on very large nets, the nets of exponential size. Uh, so if you just have depth too, then you need very large size. So the ideal result would be to show that for natural learning problems, you know, distinguishing cats from dogs or whatever, uh, you cannot do it with depth 3, but you can do it with depth 5 or whatever. Right? So that's what you'd like to show. Now, again, for reasons I already mentioned, this is not within the reach of theory because we lack mathematical formula formalization of what a natural learning problem is, okay? the problem of characterizing cats and dogs. Um, so how, how are you going to prove this result? I mean, how does this theorem even get going? Um, so recently, there have been results like this for less natural problems. So by the way, these kinds of uh, questions have been studied a lot in computational complexity, which was my uh, earlier life, some, some uh, many years ago. Uh, and there, there are results of this nature, but again, not for natural learning problems, okay? Some very artificial computational problems. And uh, so these new results are sort of in that tradition that for some very artificial problems, you can show that they require a certain amount of depth. Okay, so I want to uh, also here uh, on the role of depth, uh, make a plug for another recent paper, and, and Nadav may talk about it in his talk later on, uh, which is this intriguing observation that, we, as far as I know, is new, that increasing depth can actually be a good thing. Okay, so uh, just to set this in perspective, you know, deep learning has been around for many decades, five decades at least, as you know, and uh, the reason it never got going so far was that training deep nets, like depth more than three or four, was very difficult. And somehow modern techniques have uh, gotten around it. But in general, the feeling was that when you add more depth, the gradient is propagating through all these layers, and it gets very attenuated, becomes very noisy, and you don't make any progress. You're stuck. So you don't have a clear uh, direction for improvement. So. Yeah, generally the feeling was that adding more depth uh, is a hassle. Uh, it complicates your optimization. And uh, so you have to do something to, to, uh, to get around that. But here we are suggesting that adding more depth can add as an acceleration for optimization. Now, acceleration here is a technical word. Uh, in optimization theory in the last 20 years, there's this technique called Nestro momentum, uh, which started this. Uh, so acceleration is the idea that you don't just do gradient descent, but you also keep track of past gradients. And your, your movement, the direction of improvement, is a function of all past gradients. So you keep some memory of past gradients. And, and that can be shown for convex optimization to accelerate. Okay? The rate of convergence is, is quantitatively different than for gradient descent. So, we, uh, so I'm using this word acceleration in that technical sense. Okay? It, it is kind of like an acceleration, and experimentally it does accelerate some computation. So here's a very, very simple example to drive home the point. Regression with an L sub P loss. So P has to be bigger than 2, though. Okay? So I know P equals 2 is what everybody uses, or most people use, but P has to be slightly bigger than 2, and then this uh, kicks in. And the reason I'm describing this to you is because everybody's seen regression, and it's just such a simple model, right? And even that, you can accelerate by adding depth. All right, so uh, yeah, so regression is you have, you have instances x and labels y. y could be vectors. And uh, you, you find, actually, in this case, y's are just uh, scalars. And you're trying to find uh, uh, a vector w so that x transpose w is roughly like y. And uh, now, this classical problem, which everybody knows, 
we're going to change it by making it non-convex. Okay, this is convex. And how do we make, make it non-convex? By adding a depth of one in a very trivial way. So we're going to replace this vector w by a vector times a scalar. Okay, so it's now w1 times w2, where w2 is a scalar. Now you're looking, wait, you haven't changed the problem at all. It's the same problem, right? Each vector can be represented as a vector times scalar and vice versa. It's exactly the same problem. The, the global optimum hasn't changed, right? Hasn't changed. But now if you do gradient descent on this, it's a different algorithm, right? The path it takes is very different because it has this extra variable w1. So if you, if you analyze that gradient, and you can, you can, because it's such a simple problem, you can, you can map it back to what's going on in the original uh, optimization landscape. And it's a very different movement. And that movement we show is it has acceleration terms. And uh, yeah, so you can analyze this movement, you know, gradient descent on this new objective in terms of the old objective, and it's kind of like acceleration. And it's not just in theory, also in practice. You just implement it, and you see that it beats standard acceleration methods, which are built into the standard packages like Adagrad and Adadelta, just uh, out of the box. Okay, so yeah, so that's just a teaser for uh, for a more detailed talk by Nadav. Okay, so that brings me to the main part of my talk, which is the generalization mystery. By the way, any questions or any questions so far? Yeah, yeah. So acceleration is now this larger body of algorithms, Adagrad, Adagrad, Adam, et cetera, yeah, which, which were inspired by the Nestro momentum. OK, generalization mystery. Remember this mystery that why does a net with 6 million parameters uh, classify well on unseen data after only seeing 50k data points? So this is the. Uh, the typical plot that you see in deep learning. So I apologize, I switched error, which, I was, th th which is a term I was using, craning error, to actually accuracy, okay, which is one minus error. So everything is scaled to between zero and one, and this is accuracy, not, not uh, loss. So this blue or purple uh, plot is the training accuracy, and you can see, and epochs is uh, number of passes through the data. So you can see that the training accuracy basically goes to 100% after a while. And then the generalization error keeps improving a little bit after that. So this is actually one of the mysteries. So, so it shows you that there's something else going on besides just optimization. So training loss on the training data has gone to zero. Okay, the accuracy has become 100%, basically. That's actually a, a misleading statement because it's cross entropy loss and even when it looks very close to zero, there's things happening. But OK. But the generalization error still keeps improving. OK? So the, in other words, the accuracy on unseen data keeps improving after a while. So there's something going on. And there have been theories lately trying to explain it using information bottleneck and Langevin dynamics and all kinds of things. But those are all very qualitative theories. There's, you can't really calculate numbers out of those theories. OK? Those are more like suggestions. OK, by the way, uh, this generalization mystery is, uh, you know, it, uh, it's not just a theoretical mystery. I mean, you can see that the same architecture can fit random data. And this was a paper that got a fair bit of attention by Chang et al., Google and Berkeley folks, uh, which shows that these architectures, not only do they have theoretically more capacity, they actually have capacity. They can fit data with random labels as well. So. Uh, somehow, when you feed them real data, the training results in meaningful nets, which generalize. And I must say that uh, for some time, I used to think, okay, maybe it's just uh, an academic mystery, you know, like you related to VC dimension and all those things. But uh, but now, you know, after thinking about it more, and you know, based on the things that you'll see in a, in a few minutes, I now think that maybe this, you know, it's good to understand where did all these parameters go. You know, you, you train a net with whatever millions of parameters, and somehow it's effectively acting like a net with many fewer parameters. 
So where did all those parameters go? Okay, and I think that probably has to do with all the other mysteries as well. Okay, the optimization and what is it expressing, et cetera. So I think it's good to understand this generalization mystery. So uh, intuitively, we have an idea that complicated models need more parameters and more data. Uh, sorry, complicated data needs more models with more parameters, which needs more data to data points to train. So that picture. And that's made formal uh, by generalization theory. Uh, and people don't always phrase it this way, but uh, the basic theorems of generalization theory, and there are many of them, say something like the following, that the test loss minus the training loss is upper bounded by the square root of some parameter n divided by n. m is a number of training examples. Now, these losses, as I mentioned, are all scaled to between 0 and 1. Okay, so this n you can think of as effective capacity. So that's what the, if you're trying to apply VC dimension or our model complexity and any of those uh, ideas from generalization theory, those are measuring the effective capacity. Now the simplest uh, effect, upper bound on the effective capacity is just the number of model parameters usually. And that's vacuous if n is bigger than n because both these losses are between zero and one. So if the right hand side is bigger than one, it's a vacuous statement. So, uh, so classic results are replacing n by other complexity measures like VC dimension, Radebacher complexity, et cetera. So obviously we want better measures of effective capacity. And it's known that these classical measures are bad for neural nets, okay? And, and in fact, those experimental results, you know, where they show that the neural net can fit random, randomly labeled data, that actually shows that those nets have bad complexity, uh, bad complexity measures. Okay, so there's an old notion uh, or old suggestion about what, uh, about what makes neural nets generalize better. And uh, it goes back to Hinton and Camp and Hochreiter and Schmidhuber, which is the notion of flat minima. So pictorially, it's something like this. Flat, as the name suggests, is that you take the, the minimum you found, and in the neighborhood of that, in the parameter space, the solutions are just as good, almost as good. So in that sense, it's flat. The training loss is roughly the same. So, uh, so this has been suggested many times over the years, and recently somebody, uh, Kesker et al, did an empirical test of this, a partial test, where again they find that indeed better generalization correlates with flatter minima. Although again, it's not a definitive study. You know, like everything in steep learning, you think the issue is settled, and then somebody comes along with a study which, which shows the opposite. So that, that's always an issue. So intuitively, why should flat minima have lower number of effective parameters? And it's some kind of a description length idea, right? That a flat minimum, you don't need to specify with as many bits of accuracy, right? So therefore, it has lower description length and effectively fewer number of parameters. So this is one of these many, many, many qualitative theories about deep learning, okay? So I want to distinguish between qualitative and quantitative theories here. So there are many, many qualitative theories. I alluded to those qualitative theories early as well. But can you make this quantitative, okay? Do the calculation that's implied in this qualitative description and give me a bound on the effective number of parameters. And that is a tough, tough problem. So, so let me tell you the simpler things, okay? Like uh, margin bounds for linear classifiers. So this is something classical that we teach in, in undergrad courses, that linear classifiers generalize well, namely they can be trained with much uh, less amount of data if the data is actually separable by a linear classifier and has a margin. So margin means that, let's say, so in this case I'm just talking about binary classifier, the, uh, so labels are zeros and ones, binary labels. And margin refers to that the, the ones and the zeros are separated by a fat slab, okay, of size gamma, that's the margin. So that's a little bit like a flat minimum because, you know, the minimum is this hyperplane, right, the, which is separating the data. 
and there's some slop allowed in specifying this hyperplane, right? Because there's a margin. Okay, so that's like the flat minimum that these people were referring to. And because there's slop, you would imagine that you can represent this, uh, this hypothesis with, with a lot fewer numbers. And indeed, if you do the calculation in the right way, you get something like log n over gamma square numbers. Yeah. Does this also depend on kind of the spread of the data, right? Does it slop yeah, yeah, I'm assuming the data are all unit vectors, yeah. Yeah, the normal the data, yeah. The margin, obviously, yeah. Otherwise, you can expand all the data and increase the margin, yeah. So, yeah, so this is, uh, this is the calculation you can do, and you get log n over gamma square. You can do this calculation many ways, but you can also do it this way. Uh, and so you need only that many samples to train a linear classifier with margin. The second uh, way to make it quantitative was uh, using pack-based bounds. And uh, this goes back to Langford and Caruana, and, uh, which involves the following thought experiment. So margin, of course, we understand, right? You can draw a picture for a linear classifier. What's the analogous notion of margin for a deep net? So they suggest the following notion that, uh, you know, just suggested by the margin, that suppose theta star is a deep net you have, and you imagine adding Gaussian noise to all the parameters of the deep net. So that's eta. And do those two, you know, the, the your train net and this noise net, do they have similar training noise? If they do, then you, you think that there is this flat minimum, right? There's a sea of uh, other deep nets around theta star, which are generally almost as good. So you can do that calculation and uh, get some estimate of effective capacity, but it's still not very good. Okay, so by the way, this connects up with information theory. This is the McAllister's uh, uh, pack base bound, and uh, the effective capacity actually is computed using information theory, and it's the KL divergence of two distributions. Okay, there's been a lot of work on that uh, in, uh, in, the la in the last year. Okay, so as I said, but you do these calculations uh, you, we, you, using these ideas, information theory, et cetera, but it's very hard to get non-vacuous bounds. Okay, so for VGG19, we use these methods to compute some bounds. And uh, the true number of parameters, as I said, is about uh, 6 million, so it's down there. This is a log scale. Uh, so that's the number of parameters down there. And all these methods, including the ones from the past year, actually give you orders of magnitude worse estimates than the number of parameters. Okay. So by the way, there's some asterisk in this plotting. You know, in, uh, we sort of uh, take away some nuisance factors. They're always logs and epsilons floating around in these bounds, which we take away. Okay, so this is like a clean bound. And then we just compare those clean bounds. So, yeah. What is the motivation for using Gaussian noise, like a spherical Gaussian noise? Oh, the motivation is that you can prove something about it. Okay. Yeah, as you see, you have to compute a KL divergence. Okay. I thought that like deep nets are, the power of deep nets is because you don't have all these degrees of independent freedom. Okay, well, yeah, so yeah. Hold your question for another two slides. Yeah, it does have a lot of slop. Yeah, I'll, I'll present some evidence. Yeah. So, okay. So by the way, so yeah. So now this is a new paper that I'm talking about uh, with Ronga, Benam Nishabur, and Yi Zhang. Uh, Ge is a former student now faculty at Duke. Uh, Benam is a postdoc at the IAS, and Yi Zhang is a grad student. Um, so we get estimates that are at least off the order of number of parameters. Okay? So it's still not 50,000. <laughs> and I have no idea how to push it down to 50,000. That's a very difficult problem. But at least you start getting to some, something slightly non-trivial. Okay, so uh, how is this proven? Okay, this new result. So we introduced, yeah, sorry. Distribution dependent. Yeah, this is only for the data distribution that you're given. Yeah. So is it, is it the fact that, um, so to some, to what extent uh, one could uh, exploit the fact that the data here are in a certain, you have like, I don't know, variance structure, the 
Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, uh, are we able to exploit that, you know, these are images and there's a structure? Yeah, so, so, right, so, yeah, give me a clean mathematical model of what an image is, and then, yeah, maybe, yeah. So I agree, yeah, so one should probably start with the toy model of images, some, yeah, wavelet kind of thing, yeah. Okay, so, um, uh, right, so, what's, uh, how is this proven? So, we introduce a new kind of noise stability, which is how Gaussian noise injected at, the, at a layer get, gets attenuated as it passes through the higher layers. So what this plot is showing is noise is injected at some layer. So the layer is on the x-axis, and the, so for each plot, the highest point where it's at is where the noise is injected. And on the y-axis is the error ratio. So uh, how much noise is injected as a ratio of the norm, you know, the ratio of the noise norm to the norm of the vector at the layer. So this is, you know, going up to noise uh, to ratio one, so basically as much noise as the vector. Okay, so it's a lot of noise. And nevertheless, the, the higher layers reject the noise. Okay, so the, the, so it started off, the noise started off being as high as the norm of the vector at the layer, but at the higher layers it gets attenuated to 15, 10, 15, 20%, very quickly. So the higher layers reject noise. So that's actually a very interesting property of neural nets, which uh, uh, we think is, uh, had not been noticed before. And this may remind you of some classical ideas by two famous New Jerseyans, uh, John von Neumann, who talked about probabilistic logics and, and designing computers with uh, unreliable gates, which was, of course, a pressing problem because gates were vacuum tubes, which used to burn out, and Claude Shannon. Uh, and Shannon, in his uh, kind of obituary article for Van Norman, uh, von Neumann, um, says that uh, we have in human and animal brains examples of very large and relatively reliable systems constructed from individual components which are anything but reliable. And then how does the overall computation get reliable? So they, they did this via information theory and re redundancy. Okay, so that was to say that, you know, you would imagine, based on that background, that because these neural nets are so resistant to noise, that they must be highly redundant, right? But mathematically, you have to show that, that, that you can compress the network, right, using the noise stability, which is not an easy task. This is a very complicated multi-layer computation. So let's understand noise stability for a single layer. So with no nonlinearity. So now it's just a matrix, and it's mapping x to m times x. So now you imagine adding Gaussian noise to x at the previous layer, so x plus eta, and you get m of x plus eta. Okay, which is just mx plus m eta because it's a linear operator. So because the linear operator, you know, the noise separates out and you can start analyzing this very cleanly. And noise stability for one layer means that the matrix passes the data x much better than it passes the noise. Okay, so this ratio, mx over x, divided by, uh, is much more than m eta divided by eta. Okay, so that's what noise stability means for one layer. Now on the left-hand side is you know, what's the largest it can be? It can be the largest singular value of a matrix. Okay, if you don't know singular values, don't worry too much, you know, this will be done in, a, in, in this slide and then we won't need them again. And, on the, and the right hand side is how well it transmits noise and noise just spreads itself across over all directions uniformly. So it's something like this quantity on the right. Okay, so some, some L2 norm of the singular values uh, scaled by square root n. So the fact that uh, it, uh, it rejects noise, meaning doesn't uh, transmit noise very well, means that the left-hand side is much more than the right-hand side. Okay, so it's saying something linear algebraic about this layer. Okay, and this linear algebraic prediction you can verify. Okay, so from, we know from noise stability that it must be true, and you can verify that, that yeah, the, the singular values do, are indeed very peaked. There's only a few directions which are large, and then the rest of the singular values are pretty small, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what this is suggesting is that the signal computed by the previous layers 
is aligned by the singular vectors of the there. You can't internalize M, you have to also analyze the X that come into it? No, so uh, we don't analyze it, you know, we assume, you'll see in a second, yeah. So what we're assuming is that, okay, so here. So layer cushion is this ratio, and our theory assumes that this ratio is good. And, and the compression is going to use this ratio. Okay? So it's ra the ratio is good, and then this, uh, and that the uh, x is aligning with those single values. Yeah. So uh, now the proof sketch. Okay. So as I said, noise stability implies that the network is re highly redundant, and we're going to compress it. How do we do that? So idea one. By the way, I forgot to say, compressing neural nets is a very active area in research, in applied research. Because you know they want to compress your neural net and put it in a cell phone, and so they want to compress it so that it uses less power, fits, it uses less memory, etc. So, so people have have all kinds of methods empirically to compress neural nets. So this is just one with some provable guarantees. So the idea is that you take a layer and compress it, and I'll, I'll show you the compression algorithm in a second. You compress it, and when you compress it you introduce errors in its computation. And you can show with our compression method the er errors introduced are Gaussian-like. Okay, so what the true output should be and what the compressed version gives you, the difference is Gaussian-like. And so these errors attenuate as they go through the networks as, the, as noted earlier. And so you can keep compressing the other layers. And the end result does not change too much. So compression algorithm is something linear algebraic. You Pick uh, k random sign matrices, and you take some random, uh, some combination of those matrices. Yeah. Is the Gaussianity itself very important, or is it kind of like a compressed sensing idea, where, or like a Johnson Logan Strauss idea, where just the differences between the six? Like when you compress. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, the Gaussianity is not so important. Yeah. Yeah. So just you know. Because we think it's Gaussian-like, we use a compression algorithm that generates Gaussian-like errors. That's all. You could try other things, yeah, if, if there was some other distribution. Okay, so, so there are other parameters related to, yeah? Are you still assuming that these nonlinear? Are? Are they linear? Oh, sorry. So, uh, no, this is not nonlinear. This is nonlinear. So I'm, I'm giving an overview, and now I'll give you a little bit more details. Yes, the plot I showed you was with nonlinearities, yeah, the empirical plot. This plot is with nonlinearities, yeah, on VGG. Okay, so, uh, all right, so that this is a sketch. Now I'll give you a little bit more details of the analysis. So the singular values is fine for an analyzing a single layer because it's uh, just linear, but if you have multiple layers and nonlinearities, you can't use singular values. There's no notion of singular values for nonlinear operators. So, so we have something called an interlayer cushion, um, so, which has to do with a Jacobian, which is sort of the derivative, the first, uh, the first uh, derivative with respect to the input. So you have multiple layers, this nonlinear function, and you're taking the derivative, uh, and that's a Jacobian. And so obviously the Jacobian evaluated at x is a function f. But if you evaluate at other points, not x, but other points, then it's something else. So, uh, so interlayer. So, uh, so uh, in the neighborhood of x, for a small perturbation, you would imagine it still behaves kind of like the Jacobian. Uh, so the interlayer cushion just measures for the Jacobian, you know, which is a linear operator, how well, you know, what's the ratio of this how well it uh, transmits signal versus how well it transmits noise. So that's the interlayer question, and that turns out to be pretty good too. And then the third parameter is interlayer smoothness, which is, you know, how well, which measures how well does the Jacobian approximate the function in the neighborhood. So that, that's also some smoothness parameter which you, which you can measure. So then there's a generalization bound, the effective number of parameters or effective capacity is given by those, that kind of expression which is used to evaluate this, okay? Which was the basis of that plot I showed you. 
Okay, and the proof that you know the compression works, and you know under those, uh, you know if you measure the those constants for the neural net activation, contraction, layer cushion, interlayer cushion, etc., uh, and then you plug in those values, you know to show that you know you can compress a neural net to have that kind of capacity. That's difficult. Okay, that's the mathematical proof. Yeah. Oh, yes, thank you. You compute them on the training data. Yeah. Because they're just using like Jacobian and so on. OK, so, empir uh, so empirical investigation. So uh, these parameters, uh, uh, you, you can check how they improve during training. So for instance, the uh, layer cushion. Let's look at this plot. That's really the driver of. Uh, this whole theory. So the, the, the analysis I gave you for a single layer, right, with the matrix. So at layer cushion, at random initialization, you know, when you initialize a network before training, is, you know, that on the left. And then later on, it's like this. Okay, so it's increased a lot. And uh, similarly, interlayer cushion also increases. And uh, contraction I didn't define, but it also increases. Interlayer smoothness also increases. So uh, no, sorry, interlayer smoothness doesn't, is actually already pretty good for random initialization and, and remains good. Okay, so the driver of this is the single layer cushion, turns out, in, in the theory. All right. Uh, correlation to generalization, so we ran some experiments, so you can imagine corrupting the training data, like corrupt 50% of the data or something, and see how these parameters shift. And now if you have corrupted data, clearly the training won't generalize as well. Right, because you have corrupted data. So indeed, you see the effect on, on these parameters that you can measure. Uh, I also mentioned this other phenomenon earlier that uh, when you train neural nets, at some point, the training error drops to zero. Okay, on the training data, you are predicting really well. And the generalization error, you continue training and the generalization error improves. So even though the training error is basically zero, generalization error keeps improving. And indeed, you see that our bound improves past the, you know, past the stage when the uh, test error has gone down. So, uh, all right. Uh, so yeah, there's some empirical verification of the theory. Um, thus far, I was talking only about fully connected nets, but actually, you can also general, you can also extend the theory to convolutional nets, which is the interesting case. And and all the bounds I showed you actually were computed using convolutional nets. And the idea and the difficulty in convolutional nets is uh, that, as you know, that the same filter or matrix is reused at all the patches. So you're reusing the matrix parameters at various places in the image. So in some sense, the net is already compressed, right? The same parameter is being reused many, many times. So this overall uh, neural net has a very compact description to begin with. So if you, want, if you try to apply compression to this, the bad idea would be that you compress each copy of the filter independently. Now, that's a bad idea because it blows up the effective number of parameters. Okay, because all these copies now get their own parameters. They're all compressed independently. So therefore, they get their own new parameters, and that's bad. Okay, the, now they have too many parameters. Bad idea, too, is to compress each filter once and reuse it all over the image. That's a bad idea because now the air, well, it's a bad idea in theory. In practice, it probably is fine. So in, in theory, it's a bad idea because now you produce some errors, right, because of the compression, and all those errors are correlated across the image. Okay? And at least in theory, you need all these errors to be uncorrelated. Okay? Uh, they're sort of Gaussian-like. So the idea was uh, something uh, is well known in pseudorandomness. You use p-wise independent compression. Okay? So it's a hashing idea. Hashing, you can think of it, if you know hashing, is sort of like a very simple user pseudorandomness. This is a more complicated user pseudorandomness, p-wise independent compression. But anyway, you can do that and extend the analysis. OK, so I'll, uh, that brings me to the end of my talk. So these are only first cut analyses. What I've surveyed here is just the beginning of a theory of deep learning. Um, and much remains to be done. 
oh wait, I, I'm missing a slide here. Uh, I, I said here uh, that there are other things that would be nice to have theory for. Um, uh, things like deep reinforcement learning, deep, la deep models for, for language understanding, um, generative nets, deep generative nets. So there are all kinds of other aspects of deep learning, which I didn't talk about today, uh, where actually our group has also done work on, uh, where it would be nice to have more theory. Um, yeah, I wanted to advertise especially at the Institute for Advanced Study next year, 2019, 20, uh, where there'll be about 20 researchers in residence. Year after next. Year after next, yeah. Not the one in this September, but the one after this September. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in uh, visiting, uh, please contact us. Um, I have this blog, offconvex.org, off the convex path, which we started a few years ago because uh, we thought the theory was too focused on analyzing convex optimization and we wanted to go off the convex path. And uh, I have a grad seminar uh, and I have lecture notes there uh, and other resources which you're welcome to look at. So I'll stop there, thank you very much. So we have a couple minutes for questions, and uh, I guess Mickey and I will run around uh, with microphones so that the people in the stream can hear you if you have questions. Yeah, in the back, yeah. Uh, yeah, you. No, we just wait for the mic because we are live streaming. So, uh, so do you think uh, uh, training error or uh, testing error being zero is uh, enough to stop training? Um, training error being zero. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely not. Testing uh, error. Um, uh, in other words, uh, if uh, the minimum uh, or two minima has the same uh, error, uh, but they might have some other uh, characteristics that might be different from each other. That's right. Uh, so even though they are almost the same uh, global minima, they might be different in some other matrix. So you're still talking about training error, not test. Or testing. Uh, even testing. Even testing. Uh, well, currently the goodness is formulated using error, so you must have some other notion of goodness. What I can say with the of learning and perturbation to input data, for example. Right, so those are currently not being formalized in this framework, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm wondering, so you have these bounds that um, once you have a network that's trained, you can calculate these quantities and you can certify some kind of generalization bound, but you also showed that they change a lot through training. And I'm curious if you've thought about what aspects of the training cause these bounds to continue to improve or how the training process is fitting in. So mostly it's the layer cushion. You know, this, uh, the analysis in terms of the singular values for the layer. Uh, I think that's what's driving the generalization. Uh, there is one page showing the correlation between uh, the quantity you defined with the generalization error in the experiment. So I wonder, uh, is there any theoretical uh, proof for the um, upper bound of generalization error using uh, your effective capacity and... Uh, oh, that is a theorem, yeah. There is a theorem, upper bound, uh, the generalization error. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, if I wasn't clear, yeah. So, okay, so because you show mathematically that under those noise stability assumptions, you can compress a network down to that many parameters. So uh, th that is an upper bound on the effective capacity. Uh, so I, I, I've seen some uh, proof for the upper bound of generalization error using, uh, still using like a Ramar uh, complexity. So you, uh, you, you prov uh, provide a quantity. So I, I surveyed those results. Yeah, those uh, are much yeah, worse. I, I see that. Yeah. So your, your uh, path doesn't depend on like the definition of Ramar complexity. No, no. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, for the effective capacity, I wonder for original large network versus a compressed version of the same network, do you use similar result for the uh, effective capacity? Have, have you tried that? Sorry, I didn't understand. So, so, say, so say that people have a very large, very deep network, and then there are other people who try to compress that into a smaller network that have the similar error, similar accuracy. Yeah. So if, if we run the effective capacity computation on both network, but do they yield similar result? Uh, 
So I suppose I haven't, you mean if I take a random, not our compression algorithm, but like some arbitrary compression algorithm? Yes, it's sir. a good question. I, I, we haven't done that. Like, can we take the networks that are already compressed yeah. and compress them further with our ideas? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, because I, I feel like the effective, cap the effective capacity should be more like some sort of invariance there. So I just wonder if that was preserving other compression methods. Possible, yeah. It's a good question. Like, are they just picking up on the same uh, redundancy or is there some other redundancy? But yeah, as I said, for the record, I don't think that uh, this compression idea is going to fully explain, you know, why only 50,000 examples I know for 6 million parameters. So I think there's still more mystery there. Thanks. Then? Okay, okay. Um, so we should thank our speaker and uh